Welcome to Piano Unlocked, where I'll be sharing with you the keys to learning the piano. In the last episode, you learned the names of all the white notes on the piano and how to find them. And I bet you're becoming more and more comfortable finding all of those notes. All of the C's, all the E's, all the F's, all the B's, and the notes in between, the D's, the G's, and the A's. Now that you're able to recognize all those notes, it's just a short step to being able to play songs. For example, the beginning to Twinkle Twinkle Little Star consists of two G's, two D's, two E's, and another D. So now that you know where those notes are, you'll be able to play that song. didn't sound like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star at all. But those are the right notes. What went wrong? Well, there are a lot of G's and D's and E's on the piano. There's seven of them each, to be exact. As I said last time, you only have to remember seven different letters to master the musical alphabet, and that's really convenient. Uh, but the letter names don't tell you which specific note to play. They just tell you what kind of note a specific note is. So if we're going to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, I guess I'd better be more specific about how to do it. To play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, start by playing two of the same G. Then go up, or to the right, as we learned last time, to play two of the same D. Then go up one more to the very next note, to play two of the same E. And then down to the D you just played and play it one more time. Play those without pausing and you have Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Now, since there are seven of each of those G's, D's, and E's, so long as I go up to the D's, up again to the E's, and then back down to the final D, I guess I can play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star no matter whether I start on this G, on this G, or on any other G. How do I know which one to start on? Well, I could say something like start on the fourth G of the piano, but then I'd have to start the song by counting G's. One, two, three, four. Uh, but what if you're playing on a 61 key keyboard? The fourth G would be a different G than the fourth G on this piano. So we need a guaranteed way to know instantaneously exactly which note we need to play. Uh, we need something that we can just look at and respond to immediately by pressing down a note rather than having to count four G's first or remember to go up from a G to a D or any of the other things that would make playing the piano really slow if you tried to follow the spoken instructions that I gave you just before. And that's where this comes in. These five lines and the four spaces between them will tell you exactly which note you need to play in any piece of music you choose. This collection of lines and spaces is called a staff. Composers fill the staff with dots called notes, which correspond to specific notes in your voice or on the piano or a violin or a bassoon, or even on an instrument that hasn't been invented yet. In fact, while I was telling you what a staff is just now, I was writing the melody to Twinkle Twinkle Little Star on it. But hold on. The staff has five lines and four spaces in between them. That's uh, nine places to put a note. But the piano has 88 keys. How can this little staff possibly communicate all the notes on a piano or on any other instrument? Well, in order for the notes a composer puts on a staff to make any sense at all, there's something else that needs to go on the staff too, and that's called a clef. To understand what a clef does, let's join Michelle for a little detour. If you found this episode by typing pianoalock.com into your browser, you must know this alphabet. It's called the Latin or Roman alphabet, and there are about a hundred languages that use it or some variation of it. But you need to know which of those languages you're reading before you try to read something written in this alphabet. The letters themselves don't mean anything. 
Take these four letters, for example, G-I-F-T. In English, a gift is a present. We all love getting gifts. Look how happy the overtone superhero is. But in German, gift is poison. The overtone isn't happy about that at all. And in Spanish or French, G-I-F-T doesn't mean anything. It's just four random letters, which makes the overtone very confused. Notes on an empty staff don't mean anything at all. They're just a collection of dots, in the same way that a collection of letters isn't a word outside the context of a particular language. A clef tells you which notes the lines and spaces of the staff refer to, sort of the way a sign that says in German or in English would tell you what the letters G-I-F-T refer to. Western music notation uses three clefs. The one on the left is called a G clef, because whichever line it circles in that lower loop will be a G. The one in the middle is an F clef, because whichever line cuts between the two dots on its right side will be an F. And the one on the right is called a C clef, because whichever line goes through the center of the clef will be a C. All of these clefs are movable, which means I could center them around any of the five lines on the staff, and that line would be a G, F, or C, depending on which clef I was using. And wow, that would be confusing. Well, the good news is we really haven't been moving the G or the F clef around too much for the past 300 years or so. And the piano doesn't use the C clef, though the cello, the viola, and the trombone sure do. So all you need to learn is one position of the G clef and one position of the F clef, and you'll be all set. But I think it's really interesting, and I also think it gives you a much deeper understanding of what you're learning to share these extra details with you. Also, since the G clef and the F clef will be fixed in one spot, we don't have to call them a G clef and an F clef anymore. Because when a G clef curls around the line that's second from the bottom on the staff, and let's just call that second line, we count lines and spaces on the staff from bottom to top, that G clef is called a treble clef. And when the dots on an F clef surround the fourth line, it's called a bass clef. Those names come from voice parts. In British choirs in the 1500s, a treble was a boy whose voice hadn't changed yet. He was most comfortable singing around here. When there's a treble clef on the staff, the five lines and four spaces cover this range of notes. On the other hand, a bass is the lowest part in a choir. It's a part that's still used today. And basses like to sing around here. When there's a bass clef on the staff, the five lines and four spaces cover this range of notes. So between the bottom of the bass clef and the top of the treble clef, we have a way to read and write every note on the piano except the extreme top and bottom. And there's an easy way to write those notes too, but we'll talk about that in another episode. For now, let's take a close look at each clef and learn which note corresponds to each line and space on it. When music is written in treble clef, the five lines of the staff from bottom to top refer to E, G, B, D, and F but not just any E, G, B, D, and F. The E on the bottom line of the treble clef is the E in the very middle of the piano. On most acoustic pianos, the name of the piano manufacturer will be printed over that E. If you're using an electric piano or a keyboard, the brand name might be in a different place, but this E will still be in the middle. The G on the second line of the treble clef is the G just to the right of that E. Remember, that's where the treble clef, which is a G clef, curls around the staff. The B on the third line is above that G, then the D, then the F. E, G, B, D, F. We call these notes by their line names. First line E, second line G, third line B, fourth line D, and fifth line F. Now, you'll want to go over this information a whole lot, but don't worry. Not only can you watch this lesson as many times as you want, I've made a set of free flashcards that you can download and print out from the link at the bottom of this post on pianounlocked.com. 
And I've made those flashcards both for the treble and for the bass clef. Let's look at the bass clef now. The five lines on the bass clef are G, B, D, F, and A. The notes on the bass clef begin a little more than an octave to the left of center on the piano. An octave, by the way, is the distance between two notes that have the same letter name. From C to C is an octave, and from G to G. It's called an octave because it holds notes with eight letter names, the two notes with the same letter name, and the six notes between them. Well, the bass clef begins on the G an octave below the center of the keyboard. The second line is B. Then third line D, fourth line F, and fifth line A. G, B, D, F, A. You may have noticed that the lines on the treble clef and the lines on the bass clef share a lot of the same note names. Uh, for example, treble clef has a G on the second line. Well, bass clef has a G too, but it's on the first line. And of course, they're completely different Gs, but it can still be a little confusing to remember which is which. Here's something that helps. Say things to yourself like, G is on the first line on the bass clef, but it's the second line on the treble clef. F is the fifth line on the treble clef, but it's the fourth line on the bass clef. Identifying those differences and making a note of them really helps you remember them. And that's also why I teach treble and bass clef at the same time. It might seem more manageable to introduce treble clef first and to give you some time to get comfortable with it before throwing bass clef at you. And there's a lot of music that you could play just using treble clef alone. But I found that if you wait to learn bass clef, it's not only harder to learn, it also makes you kind of confused about treble clef too, just when you were starting to get used to it. And that's no fun at all. What we're doing together gives you more things to remember from the beginning. Uh, two ways of reading the staff to learn instead of one. But it also gives you the opportunity to master the differences between the two clefs right away. When I was playing the lines in the treble and the bass clef just before, you saw that I skipped over a note between each one. Well, those are the spaces. You remember that the lines in the treble clef are E, G, B, D, and F. Do you see the notes that I'm not holding down? Those are F, A, C, and E. And they're numbered from bottom to top just like the lines are. First space F, second space A, third space C, and fourth space E. And it's the same situation in the bass clef. The lines are G, B, D, F, and A, and the spaces are right in between. First space A, second space C, third space E, and fourth space G. And this is what those notes look like on the staff. F, A, C, and E on the four spaces in the treble clef, and A, C, E, and G on the four spaces in the bass clef. The two staffs together, connected by a vertical line and a curved brace, is called a grand staff, and that's what you'll most often be reading piano music on. As we've been looking at the notes in treble and bass clef, we've been seeing the same letters over and over again. E, for example, we've talked about three E's. There's the third space E in the bass clef. There's the first line E in the treble clef. And there's the fourth space E in the treble clef. Those are three different E's, and just like I said that it's really useful to articulate the differences between them to yourself and make a note of them, it's also really helpful to practice them all in one group. And just like in the last episode when I came up with some games and challenges for you to use so that quizzing yourself on where to find all of the B's or all of the C's stays fun and interesting, we can make up some similar games to help you get familiar with the treble and bass clef. What if you um, play the third space E three times, and then play the fourth space E in the treble clef twice, and then the first line E once? And try to do that as fast as you can. Or what if you 
close your eyes and press down any note at all. And if it's one of the notes that we've covered in the treble or bass clef, go ahead and say what it is. That's third line B in the treble clef. In fact, if you print out the blank staff paper that I've put a link to at the bottom of this post on pianounlock.com, you can even write whatever note it is that you're playing on the paper. Wow, quizzing myself like this is making me hungry. Uh, hold on just a minute while I get a snack. Did you know that music hasn't always been written on the staff we use today? The earliest music notation that has been discovered was written around 1400 BCE in Ugarit in the Hurrian language. This tablet provides the words and melody to a hymn and even tells the performer which strings to use on the lyre. Ancient Greece used a system of musical notation that combined letters, lines, and dots to show melody and rhythm. And India, Korea, and China all developed ways of using the alphabet to notate music. In Western music, the five-line staff developed from something called nooms. These shapes helped monks remember the complicated chants they sang. The problem, though, was that they only specified what direction the melody went in and not what note it started on or how far up or down the melody went. Can you imagine a cloister full of monks singing all on different notes with their melodies going up and down different distances? It doesn't sound exactly beautiful or peaceful, does it? Well, in 1025, a Benedictine monk named Guido of Arezzo decided that a four-line staff would help people know exactly what pitches a melody had even if they had never heard the melody before. Staffs with five lines instead of four began becoming popular in Italy in the 1200s, and for a few hundred years, people in Europe wrote music on staffs with either four, five, or six lines. But around 1600, the five-line staff became the standard. There's no definite answer about why that happened. One reason might be that having an odd number of lines makes it easy to spot the center. But what we do know is that any sheet music you buy today will be printed on staffs with five lines. Mmm. Mmm. This fudge is so good. Now that it's been a few minutes, do you still remember the names of the lines on the treble clef? E, G, B, D, F, right? Good, good. And the bass clef lines? G, B, D, F, A. It can be hard to remember a combination of letters like that. I mean, they don't spell anything. It's like G-I-F-T in Spanish or French. Well, that's why a lot of people like to use funny sentences that use those letters as their initials. But I really encourage you just to learn the letters themselves. I mean, it's true, every good boy deserves fudge, um, but maybe not at the piano. See, using a sentence to help you remember the lines or spaces on the treble or bass clef uh, puts an extra step between you and the note. If you see a note on the second line in the treble clef, it's just so much quicker to say G than to think every good boy deserves fudge. So, um, every good, good starts with G, so that note must be a G. Now, your thought process will move a lot faster than the time it took me to say all that, and eventually you just know that second line on the treble clef is G, uh, but wouldn't you rather start by knowing that? rather than getting there eventually. Great, all clean. Let's get back to the piano. If you saw the last episode, and if you haven't, you can find it online at pianounlock.com forward slash episodes. It's the first episode called Finding the Keys. Well, you might remember that Michelle asked a question toward the end, and I promised I would answer it in this episode. If the musical alphabet goes from A to G, why are you starting with C? And what's the alphabet if you're not in an English-speaking country? And now that we've talked about the names of the notes both on the keyboard and on the staff, that question is even more puzzling. We've used C, E, F, and B to learn where the notes are on the piano itself. We've also learned that E is the first line on the treble clef, and that G is the first line on the bass clef. So doesn't anything start with A? Well, the piano does. But that's actually only been the case since about the mid-1800s. Now, we know that the treble clef starts on this E because that's close to the bottom of a young boy's vocal range. And the bass clef starts on this G because that's toward the bottom of a bass's vocal range. 
But why is C so important? The earliest system in Western music for giving letter names to notes is in a textbook written around 500 by the Roman philosopher Boethius. His musical alphabet went from A through P, which spanned two octaves. A referred to the lowest note on the instruments in use at the time. By the 900s, the musical alphabet was pared down to span just one octave, which left it with the seven letters we use today. But then our friend Guido of Arezzo, who came up with the four-line staff, came up with something else to help singers remember melodies. If you were to play all the white notes from A to A, or from B to B, or from C to C, or from any note to the next note with the same letter name, you'd be playing a scale. And each of those scales has a distinctive sound based on how close in pitch each of its notes is to each of its other notes. Don't worry, we'll be talking about that in the next episode. Well, Guido of Arezzo noticed that in a very well-known hymn to John the Baptist called Ut Queant Loxis, each line of the hymn began one note higher than the previous line. The hymn happened to begin on C, and the first word of the hymn happened to be ut. The first word of the second line was resonare, and its first syllable, re, was on D. Guido decided to name each of the notes of the C scale after the syllables they corresponded to in the hymn. resonare fibris, and so on and so forth. You can hear how each phrase begins one pitch higher than the previous one. It's the same concept as in The Sound of Music with uh, the much catchier tune, Do a Deer. Well, speaking of Do, in Italy in the 1600s, uh, singers replaced Ut with Do because that syllable is easier to sing. And those syllables, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, and Si, are what musicians in Italy, Portugal, France, Romania, Greece, Albania, several other countries in Europe, also Vietnam, as well as some countries in the Middle East, those are the syllables they use to name the notes. In Germany, Hungary, and most of Scandinavia, uh, the notes have the letter names A through G, but also H, which refers to the black note just to the left of B. But Guido of Arezzo's idea of remembering the sound of the C scale through the syllables of the hymn that used it proved to be so useful that to this day, C is the first note and the first scale that most piano students and students of many other instruments learn. And that's not just because of tradition. We'll be learning much more about the C scale starting with the next episode. Wow, we've covered a lot in this episode you're really going to enjoy practicing note reading. Like I said, I've made some flashcards to help you come up with lots of fun games and challenges, and I've written out the melody to Twinkle Twinkle Little Star for you to play. But did I leave any questions unanswered? Yes. Why do you start Twinkle Twinkle Little Star on G if C is the first note people learn on the piano? Well, that's an excellent question, and this is the perfect time to ask it because the answer has to do with what we'll be talking about in the next episode. So hold that thought. And uh, meanwhile, did I leave any of your questions unanswered? If so, send me an email at myron at pianounlocked.com, and I will answer them in one of the next episodes. And make sure to subscribe on the website so you never miss a single key. Until next time, happy practicing! <laughs>